Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Thank you, choir, for that beautiful, beautiful song. It goes well with the sermon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Excited about, always excited to preach the word that God has put on my heart. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for all that our eyes have seen, our ears have heard. Thank you, Lord, for all we have gathered today. Thank you, Lord, for the word that, is, that will go forth. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. This morning's message is, this is Jesus the prophet, and he's more than enough. I start this morning's sermon as I sometimes do, and that is with a question. And my question this morning is, who is Jesus? If I brought you the microphone, would you be able to tell me something accurate about Jesus, or would our conversation sound like Jimmy Kimmel's sidewalk interviews on Hollywood <laughs> Boulevard? If you haven't watched Jimmy Kimmel, please do so and you'll, you'll see what I mean. We serve a wonderful Savior, who walked this earth and said a lot and did a lot and changed a lot of lives, but many of us only know that Jesus was born of a Virgin Mary on Christmas, right? And, and was crucified and died on Good Friday. It was Good Friday when he died, right? And, and got up early on Sunday morning with all power in his hands, or at least that's what and since that's a statement that is repeated often, is that the most important thing to know about Jesus? Who is Jesus? And what did he do and why did he do it? The Apostles' Creed taught some of us, most of us, whether we realize it or not, all that we know about Jesus. Listen to the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated on the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the church universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Whether we realize it or not, this creed has shaped what most Christians and Christian nations know about Jesus. It highlights his birth. And notice it jumps all the way from his birth to his death and resurrection. Think about that. It highlights his birth, Christmas, and his death, Good Friday, and his resurrection, Easter. Our faith and, our, and the faith statement of many, if not most Christians, can be characterized by the most commercialized holidays the world has ever seen. Christmas and Easter. Christians, especially in this country, can get caught up in these holidays and be completely oblivious to who Jesus is and what Jesus stood 
stood for and stands for. And sometimes to me, that feels like it's by design. That some powers that wanted to be sure that Christians are oblivious to Christ set up a situation where the bookends of his life are celebrated as holidays and we don't care much about what happens in between. And it feels like there are powers and principalities and high places that benefit from the ignorance of Christians. So I ask my question again, who is this Jesus? And what did he do and why did he do it? And why did his teachings and actions cause him to suffer a state-sanctioned and crowd-endorsed execution by crucifixion? I'm sorry, I have a few more questions. <laughs> do we even feel as Christians that it is important to know who Jesus is and what Jesus did and stood for. Does it matter as the church? Does it matter for the function of the church that we understand what Jesus did and why Jesus did what he did? Does it matter for the songs that we sing or the sermons that we preach? Does it matter for who enters this building and how they are treated? Who Jesus is? On this day of our annual church-wide meeting, does it matter on the committee on which you serve who Jesus is? Does it matter in our decision making? Does it matter in how we spend our time? Does it matter at all on this day of our annual meeting of the church? Does it matter who Jesus is and why Jesus came and what Jesus stood for and stands for? My prayer is that our answer as a church is an, is an emphatic yes, it absolutely matters who Jesus is and what Jesus did and, and stands for. Yes, it matters for the songs we sing and the sermons that we preach. It matters for how we treat every person who enters this building. It matters. Jesus matters on this day of our annual meeting. It matters on the committees that you serve. It matters in the roles that we play as pastors. It matters. And understanding of Jesus matters in our decision making. It matters in how we spend our time. It matters who Jesus is and why Jesus came and what Jesus stood for. It matters how I part in your church and it should matter for every church. But there are thousands of churches in this city, tens of thousands in this country who open their doors on Sunday and throughout the week and people go in and they do something and people go out and with millions of Christians doing this every week, it seems that the impact of the Christian church is not what it could be or should be to the world around it. And this is a tragedy and it's rooted, I believe, in the ignorance to who Jesus is and what Jesus did that caused him to be considered an enemy of the state and a threat to the powers that be and a threat to the status quo. And since we're going to do church, High Park Union Church, we might as well do church in a way that represents accurately as possible the cause of Christ, seeking to do the work of Christ and the will of God, so help us God. Who is this Jesus? I did not come to debate Jesus' ethnicity as a Galilean or Palestinian Jew. That's not my point. I did not come to debate or prove that he was the son of God. I came to see what Jesus' words and actions tell us about who he is, his motivations, his message, his movement. For if we as followers understand his motivations, his message, and his movement, then we can know what we should be doing as a church. We can be confident in our roles and what they're all about. We can understand what we shall spend our time on, for we are Christians, and Jesus said they'll know we are Christians by our love. And, and Tina Turner said, what's love got to do with it? And if we understand Jesus, we understand the answer to Tina Turner's question, what love has to do with it. Love has everything to do with it. Who is Jesus? That's the question in our scripture today. Jesus is entering Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. People are waving palms, singing 
Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Laying the cloaks on the ground as Jesus enters on the donkey. It's a big scene. It's a big deal. And the scripture says in Matthew 21, 10, that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds, when asked the question I've been asking this morning, who is this, answered with these words. This is Jesus. The prophet, say the prophet. Pro the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I've heard some people argue that we downplay who Jesus is when we call him a prophet. He was more than a prophet, they say. He was the son of God. And they start talking about those holidays, Christmas and Easter. The fact that he was born of a virgin Mary and that he rose from the dead. And I believe this. The same, and my faith in Jesus holds these miraculous truths close and near and dear to my heart about our Savior. But let's not move too fast past the words of the crowd. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. What is a prophet? And why did the crowds call Jesus a prophet? This past Friday and Saturday, McCormick held the Bonhoeffer Lectures, where theologians across the country were invited to come and give lectures that reflect the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Show you how God works. At the same time, I was mulling over in my head what I would be preaching this Sunday. And knowing I'm going to preach about Jesus the prophet, I needed some words that describe prophet better than what's in Webster. <laughs> I'll tell some of you all about that another time. <laughs> I go to the lectures not knowing that God is about to provide just what I need. The Reverend Jonathan Wilson Hargrove, a theologian, writer, and preacher who works closely with Reverend Dr. William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign, lectured along with Barber at McCormick this past Friday. And during his lecture, he stated, and I quote, that the role of a prophet is to demonstrate in word and deed that a different posture is possible in public life. And then, and I paraphrase this part, he said, a prophet interrupts what's happening in the world interrupts the status quo with directives from the divine. I said, oh, that's good. Jesus, by Wilson Harbaugh's definition, with which I obviously agree, is a prophet. Jesus, I'm sure, maybe along with the other biblical prophets, were a model for Harbaugh's definition. Jesus' ministry was a prophetic ministry from the very beginning. Jesus demonstrated by word and deed that a different posture is possible in public life. In other words, Jesus demonstrated that things don't have to be as they are. It was in Luke, the fourth chapter, that Jesus stood at the beginning of his ministry and read from the Isaiah scroll these words, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, a different posture. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, a different posture. Recovery of sight to the blind, a different posture. To set the oppressed free, a different posture. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, a different posture. Then Jesus said, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Demonstrating in word, as prophets do, that a different posture is possible in public life and that things don't have to be as they are. As a matter of fact, and excuse me, and it matters that the church knows this text. In six short months, the two of us have preached it several times. And that we know this Jesus, the Jesus, the prophet. The crowds in our text today say that this is Jesus, the prophet, and the second part of Hargrove's definition of a prophet is that a prophet interrupts what's happening in the world, interrupts the status quo with directives from the divine. And the people, the crowds even had experienced this phenomenon with and through Jesus 
that when Jesus entered the scene, he interrupted the status quo with directive from the divine. In other words, things changed when the prophet Jesus spoke and when the prophet Jesus acted. Ask the man that Pastor Sarah preached about last night at the pool of Bethesda. Ask him what happened when Jesus came on the scene. And he'll tell you that the lame walk. Because of Jesus. Ask blind Bartimaeus what happens when Jesus comes on, him, on the scene and blind Bartimaeus will tell you that the blind see. Because of Jesus. Ask Lazarus, Mary, and Martha and they'll tell you that the dead live because of Jesus. Ask the 5,000 men plus women and children and they'll tell you that the hungry eat because of Jesus. Ask the ten lepers, and at least one of them will tell you that the leper is healed because of Jesus. Jesus, the prophet, led a prophetic ministry that demonstrated in word and deed that a different posture was possible in public life. And he interrupted the status quo with directives from the divine people. The crowds even experienced that things don't have to be as they are and people got a taste of thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They got a glimpse of God's will on earth and the church should be doing the same. And in order for us to do the same things that Jesus did, I believe there's a principle we need to understand that was at the core of Jesus' prophetic ministry. I said we need to understand the motivation the message and the movement of Jesus. Well, the motivation of Jesus was love and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But at the core of the message and the movement, I believe, is a principle we need to understand, and that is the principle of scarcity and abundance. Think about it. In just about every miracle, Jesus demonstrates that what seems scarce is really abundant in God's kingdom. That God's will is that people have what they need and that people are free to live with, not with scarcity, but with abundance. I, I'm not preaching the prosperity gospel. I'm preaching the reality that a mentality of scarcity, that there's not enough, leads to oppression, slavery, violence, abuse of power, and unfair distribution of resources and education, and a lack of access to opportunity. All of which was status quo in scripture and status quo in our world. But the prophet Jesus and the prophetic ministry of the church is to interrupt the status quo with directives from the divine and demonstrate a new reality is possible because the myth of scarcity is just that, a myth. For in God there is more than the knowledge. When Jesus healed the sick, he demonstrated that in God's will, there is healing for all. When the world says that the best health care is for those who can't afford it, Jesus prophetically demonstrated that in the will of God, everyone should have health care. God created our bodies, God created the care of our bodies. And the care of our bodies is not a political matter for posturing and positioning about the health of the masses when Congress has excellent health care benefits. And let me toss this in. There's nothing worse than a group of men gathering to make decisions about women's health care. Nothing worse. And ultimately cutting funding to crucial care for women. Jesus healed the woman with the issue of blood. He healed every disease, every pre-existing condition. And this still speaks prophetically against the status quo that healing is for everyone. When Jesus fed the masses with two fish and five loaves, he prophetically demonstrated that the myth that food is scarce is just that, a myth. There is more than enough food to go around. Somebody say amen. For the crowds were there and they were hungry. And get this, the disciples, with the 
their mindsets of scarcity. Said Jesus sent them away. But Jesus the prophet took two fish, five loaves, and gave thanks, blessed it, and served it. He prophetically demonstrated that in the will of God, and in the economy of God, there is no lack. There is enough for everyone. The myth of scarcity maintains a status quo that keeps the poor poor and the rich rich. It maintains a violent society. It maintains a cutthroat society and cutthroat organization. Jesus came to demonstrate that God is a God of abundance, that God is a God of fairness, that God is a God of justice, and that God is a God of equity. Jesus the prophet demonstrated that there are enough resources for everyone. And not that there are just material resources for everyone, but there's enough love and enough peace and enough joy and enough comfort for everyone. And when the status quo hoards and oppresses and mistreats and miseducates and incarcerates and impoverishes the people, it is the prophetic ministry of the church to demonstrate in word and deed that a different posture is possible in public life. The prophetic ministry of the church is to interrupt the status quo with directives from the divine to call out evil when we see it, to name the middle of scarcity when we see it. So when the world says there's not enough food, we can say there's more than enough. When Washington, D.C. says there's not enough health care, we can say there's more than enough. When the mayor says there's not enough to stop the violence, we can say there's more than enough. For we know that God is a God of abundance. We know that God is a God of provision. That God is a God of healing. That God is a God of truth. We know, yes, that Jesus was born a virgin. Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and was resurrected on the third day. But we need to know as the church that Jesus was a prophet who demonstrated God's abundance. I wish they would just add that right in to the Apostles' Creed. Who upset the status quo with directives from the divine. And we know Jesus the prophet. When we know Jesus the prophet, we can walk prophetically like Jesus walked. And talk prophetically like Jesus talked. And live prophetically. Then act prophetically like Jesus acted. Until people get a taste of thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, a glimpse of God's will on earth. Until we all, as, as the, the, the person who gave the funds to the Morehouse students says, we put our shoulders into that heart of the world universe and it bends even more towards justice. Hyde Park Union Church, let us work together to be the church that God prophetically desires us to be. On this day of the annual church-wide meeting, does it matter on the committee which you serve who Jesus is? Yes, it matters. Does it matter how we spend our time who Jesus is? You don't believe it matters. It absolutely matters who Jesus is and what Jesus did and stood for. Yes, it matters for the songs we sing and the sermons we preach. It matters how we treat every person who enters this building. It matters. Jesus matters on this day. It matters on the committee you serve and the roles we play as pastors and the roles we all play in God's house. It matters to understand Jesus. It matters in our decision making. It matters in how we spend our time. It matters who Jesus is, why Jesus came, and what Jesus stood for. It matters for Hyde Park Union Church and it should matter for every church that Jesus is a prophet. And prophets interrupt the status quo with directives from the divine and demonstrating the reality. And that a new reality is indeed possible for all of God's people. Let us go forth and be the church God desires us to be. Amen. Amen. amen and amen. God bless you.